here. Uh, today we actually start um, a, a new series called The Favor of God. But before we go into all that, how many of you were here last week? Yeah, last week was great. We had uh, Jordan share his story with us. And if you're not here, I want to encourage you to head on to our YouTube channel and just see the message and possibly share it with other people. Now, I've shared it with many people as well. And I know many people have been blessed by it. Yeah, so today, like I said, we're starting a brand new series called The Favor of God. Help me tell the person beside you, you look like... You look yeah, go like, ahead. You look like, you, like, you look like someone favored by God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is... Um, this is a series of teaching that would impact, impact us greatly. And I trust that God is going to do a deep work here. Uh, you know, last, last year, uh, I think 17th of December precisely, uh, I did a sermon called, um, What About the Fork? What About the Favor of God? And I just had a feeling that it was going to turn into a series. And so now God has brought the series for us. It's called The Favor of God. Uh, when, you, when you begin to relate with people, or when you begin to have friends, close friends, we're going to discover that we are not perfect. There's no perfect person. I mean, we people progress, people grow, but there's no perfect person. Yeah, I'm, I'm not perfect as well, but I actually know what it means to be favored by God. Yeah. And so I'm going to share so many stories from all that in this series. And I'm going to trust that God is going to bless us really well in Jesus' name. Amen. So please don't miss any of the next four Sundays, because this is going to be a four-week journey. We are embarking on a life-changing journey. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be looking at four things that position us for the favor of God. Yeah. We cannot buy the favor of God. It is not for sale. It's not in the market. <laughs> it's not in Hasda. <laughs> yeah. But we can position ourselves for it. Yeah, we can position ourselves for it. And when we position ourselves for it, God releases it. That's what we're going to do. Um, as I go further, I want you to know that if you're a follower of Christ, favor is your heritage. Is your right. And if you look at 2 Peter 1 3, it says that God has given unto us everything that pertains to life and godliness. God has given us favor. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. The book of Psalms says that God blesses the righteous with favor. Yeah, it, it, is, it is our right as a Christian, as, 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 a, as a follower of Christ. And what, what, begin to happen, what begins to happen is that you begin to discover that effort can get you nowhere in life. It is the favor of God that will get you to somewhere. Yeah, favor is, is the way up. It's the way up. So, but before we proceed, let's quickly define that word favor. Let's quickly define it so that we can have a premise to journey on for the next four weeks. Yeah, favor, you may want to take your, write, write it down. There's, there's a note pad beside you and your pens all around you. Favor means tangible evidence. Yeah, that a person has the approval of God. That's, that's the favor of God. Tangible proof that, that a person has the approval of God. Now, this is not just about material things. Not talking about just having a car and all those kind of things it's about all-round evidence yeah that somebody has an approval of god you can enjoy favor maritally you can enjoy favor spiritually you can enjoy favor in your career you can enjoy favor in school you can enjoy favor in terms of protection you can enjoy favor in terms of assistance and in so many other areas yeah and what happens is that the favor of god flows into the favor of men so if i'm favored by god God will make men to favor me. Yeah, are we together? Yes. So, uh, when, when, when God favors us, it pushes men to favor us. Yeah. Uh, and there are people in our life that we actually favor. Yeah. There are people that we favor because when somebody favors us, we want to favor them as well. Yeah. We want to be able to help them. We want to be able to serve them. We delight in them. We, we connect with them uh, in a way that we don't connect with other people. So it's the same way with God. God shows favor to the people who connect to him. He shows favor to the people who delight in him. He shows favor to the people who honor him. So let's get the definition clear. For this series, our definition of favor is tangible evidence that a person has the approval of God. Or let's say the demonstrated delight or an act of kindness from God beyond what is usual. It is, it is unusual, beyond what is usual. Okay? Do we get that? Yeah. yeah. So how many of you would like, based on this definition, how many of you would like a greater level of favor, of God's favor upon your life? Yeah, yeah, everybody wants that. So let's take our confession as we as we embark on that journey. Comes up on the screen. Once you're ready, go. Today, I'm humble enough to open my heart, my eyes, my ears, to let God's word reach me. I participate and listen with humility. I obey and practice what I hear with faith. Because God is my friend. I'm receptive and fully attentive 
to receive all that God has for me today. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we're going to look through the life of Joseph today. Uh, many people here would know the story of Joseph in the Bible. Uh, Joseph was a guy favored by God. Everywhere he went, he was enjoying favor. He enjoyed the favor of God. Uh, however, there was a time in Joseph, Joseph's life that he had a dream. And so, he, the dream was so exciting. Sometimes when you have a dream, you are so excited. The dream was so exciting that he went and, began, and, and started sharing the story, started sharing the dreams with his brothers. Yeah. And so when he told his brothers the dream, they hated him. They didn't like him for that. For that because the dream was basically that he saw his brothers bowing down to him. Yeah, that was, that was, that was the dream. And so the brothers, the brothers were not happy. As be, uh, they, they, don't, they didn't want him to succeed. So what they did was they sold him off. They, for first they put him in a pit, and then they sold him off to the Ishmaelites. Just say, you go die somewhere. We don't want you to succeed. Yeah, that's blood brothers. Can you imagine? Sometimes we think that our families are dysfunctional. You've got to read the Bible and see strange people. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, but what God did was that he worked everything together for the good of Joseph. Yeah, so Joseph enjoyed the favor of God all through the process. Yeah. Each, neg each negativity that Joseph faced was actually pushing him closer and closer to the realization of God's plan for his life. It was pushing him closer and closer to the dream that God had for him. His brothers wanted to abort the process, but they didn't know that they were fast-tracking the process. Amen? Amen? Yeah, so that's why you can't just go all over the place and be praying that God should kill all your enemies. Because sometimes God will want to use your enemies to position you to the next level. Praise God, everybody. Amen. Yeah. The last time I checked, the Bible says that God works all things together for the good of those who love God. Yes. Do you love God? Yes. yes. So all things, the good things, the bad things, the not so nice things, they are working together for your good. So you've got to rest. You've got to rest. So Joseph became the prime minister eventually. Yeah. And he was put in charge of of the world food program <laughs> because there was famine all over the place but he was the leader he was the one in charge and so people had to come from everywhere and uh, joseph's brother had to come as well from from where they were to egypt to come and buy food from joseph yeah and so joseph saw saw them what do you think his natural reaction should be it should be hatred it should be bitterness it should be punishment it should be rejection yeah you are the ones that sold me off i should deal with you now now it's time for me to take vengeance but let's see what joseph did to them so our text is Genesis 45, 1 to 8. If you have your Bible, open it to it. Um, it can also come up on, it also comes up on the screen. Genesis 45, 1 to, 1 to 8. Yeah, I'm going to read. It says, Joseph could stand it no longer. Yeah, there were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. So he, he unveiled himself. Then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians could hear him. And the word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. He said again, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Verse 5. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God. Can you say it was God? It was God. Yeah, it was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. You see how God works? Joseph had moved on in forgiveness, but his brothers were still stuck where he left them. He had moved on, he had moved on, he had moved, he had moved on. Verse 6. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years. And there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God. He said it again. It was God who sent me here, not you. And he's the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. That, that is faithful. That is faithful. So our subject for today, our topic for today is radical forgiveness. Radical forgiveness. Radical forgiveness. That is one of the four things that positions us for the favor of God. Yeah. Radical forgiveness. Okay, let me start this way. I, I probably shared this story with you, some of you before. Um, but several, several years ago, long before I met my wife, Debbie, I was in love with a lady. Some of you are like, really? <laughs> I was in love with a lady. We actually made plans about the future. Um, we met our parents. Everything seemed to be going on well 
until I started seeing signs of inconsistency and strange characteristics from this lady. Yeah, my heart was so into it, I was really committed to it, friends. <laughs> yeah, I had dreams and hopes with this person, and I was quite committed to it. Then one day, she called me and said she's got, she had something to tell me. Bad idea. Anytime somebody calls you to say, I've got something to tell you, don't go. It's a bad idea. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So she, she told me that she was no longer interested in me, and um, I would no longer be able to meet her needs. Yeah, I was shattered, devastated, and wounded. Yeah. I had invested my time, my resources, my energy into the relationship and it was all gone with, with her decision. Yeah. But after a few months, this is this is where it gets interesting. After a few months, I heard that she was getting married. Um, that's fine. But I discovered that the person that she was getting married to was somebody I knew all along. So they had been cooking up something <laughs> while the relationship was going on. Yeah. That's 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 big, isn't it? Yeah. But when I heard the news I struggled, I was lonely, I was sad. And it was very hard because everything had happened so fast. Yeah. But what I did was I asked God for grace. I asked God for strength. I dealt with it. And finally summoned the courage to let it go and, for, and forgive her. Amen. So I said it. I had to say it loud to myself several times. Of course, it had to come from the heart. But I said, I forgive you. I let it go. I forgive you. I let it go. I forgive you. Hallelujah, everybody. Amen. Yeah, I could have been bitter. I could have been weak. I could have been destroyed by that. Uh, incident, well, I forgave her and then I, I moved on. Yeah, it, it was so much later on that God sent the beautiful Debbie into my life. Somebody yeah. shout hallelujah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Debbie, my God of ordained wife, a long and short of all this is that I'm glad that it happened because I met Debbie after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I, when I look at both both parties, I'm more grateful than with the better one. Amen. Amen. And that's why the Bible says that either finds a wife, finds a good thing, and obtains Amen. favor. Yeah. Favor. From the Lord. Yeah. So if she did not leave, I wouldn't have met Debbie. If she did not leave, so many great things have happened in my life since then would not have happened. If she did if she did not leave, we probably wouldn't have the higher place right now at this point in this season. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. So I could have I could have held on to my past and missed my future. Yeah. So what happens is that we've got to learn to let things go in that regard so that we can enjoy the favor of God. Yeah. Little wonder God knows how to walk things. He says, I know how to walk all things together for your good, even when those things go wrong. Yeah, so you can, you can be so close to your past that you let it go and let it hinder your future. Yeah. Why, why should I hold on to my past when, when, the, when the future is calling? Why should, I, why should I hold on to my past when the future is, is calling? I found that many people are so consumed by the past that they fail to embrace the future that God has for them. God is trying to unveil you into a new path into new territories, but you are so so in love with your past that you don't want to let it go. You are going nowhere. You're going to stay stuck. Yeah, you're going to stay stuck. So it happened in the past. Now what? what what's going to happen? What next? What's the next thing? Yeah, when we are so controlled and consumed by the past, it hinders us from receiving the favor of God upon upon our lives. Yeah, I actually believe that there's no one in this room right now, or no one watching online that that, that doesn't have a story. Yeah, I believe that. Inside this room, there, there, there are stories of betrayals, there are stories of disappointments, there, there are stories of challenges from an individual, from a group of people. It could be as far as 20 years ago, it could be, it could be, it could be as far as 10 years ago, it, it, could be as, it could be as close as yesterday. Yeah, but people have been wounded financially, people have been wounded spiritually, people have been wounded emo emotionally, maritally, and somebody must have betrayed your trust one time or the other. Raise up your hand if you've ever been disappointed by somebody. If you've ever been wounded by somebody. If you don't, if, if, you, if, you, if you're not raising up your hand, you've not lived long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we all have someone to forgive. Yeah, we all have someone to forgive. If you don't have someone to forgive today, I guarantee you, tomorrow on the train, you're going to have somebody to forgive. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes as followers of Christ, what happens is that we are quick to say, I forgive you. Because we just want to act religious. I forgive you. But is it really as clear and simple as we say? Because we've devised a way to say, oh, I'm forgiving you, but it keeps coming back. It's easier said than done. Actually, in 2015, Debbie and I went to speak in some conferences in Nigeria and Ghana. And uh, there was this, we went with two people from our team in Africa. And uh, there was this lady that said, oh, before anybody offends me, I'm forgiving them. I said, that's a good one. <laughs> so wait till next day, 
Somebody offended this lady, like some of the, some, somebody there just offended her, so something happened. And she went on and on and on and on, complaining, oh. lashing out at the person. And I was just looking at you. I said, you, I thought you said yesterday that before somebody offends you, you forgive them. So what are you doing right now? <laughs> it's easier said than done. Yeah, it's not as easy as straightforward. Yeah, yeah. There are people here who claim they're forgiving someone. But I ask you today, why are you still so touchy when you think about that person? Yeah. yeah. Why are you still so touchy when you think about that incident or that issue? I think it's important that we acknowledge that we need healing and God begins to unleash his favor upon our lives. As we take this further, let's quickly look at some common reactions when it comes to forgiveness. Some common reactions. I believe God wants to do a deep work in some of us here today and some people watching online. So let's lean into it. What are some common rea reactions? These are some of the common reactions I found when, when, people, when people offend us or when we're dealing with unforgiveness. I think the first thing is that we are quick to say that I want to bury the past, or we are quick, quick to tell people, let's bury the past. The problem with that is that you cannot bury the past. Where are you going to bury it? Central London? <laughs> you can't bury the past. You can't bury the past. So I, I, I'm growing up to understand that God's presence to heal and to deliver me is more powerful when I get honest about my condition. Yeah, because God cannot bless who I pretend to be. And that's why the Bible, Hebrews 4, 16, God says, let us come boldly. That means let us come honestly. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. That's where we're going to find his favor. And we will find grace to help us when we need it most. It's when we come honest, honestly that we find favor in time of need. The problem with pretense is that the pictures keep coming back. Yeah, because pretense never gets you anywhere. Anyway, the reality keeps coming back in moments when you are alone, in the night. Or moments where you see somebody who is thriving in a situation where you have struggled. The pictures keep coming back. It keeps coming back. When you're in bed at night, it keeps coming back. Something just triggers it every now and then. Yeah, because it's not been dealt with. So it is not possible to bury your past, but it is possible to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, we can't bury it, but we can deal with it. So God wants me to tell somebody here today, you're here, you're watching online. God wants me to tell you that you should stop trying to hide your past. Stop trying to hide your guilt. Stop trying to cover it. Stop trying to minimize it. Yeah. Unveil it to God and let him do a deep work in it. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. If it is so simple, you should have forgotten about it by now. Yeah. It can't be buried, but it can be dealt with. The second common reaction I found is that we, we blame others. We blame others. Yeah. We say, if it is not because of that person, I won't be in this situation today. We blame others. It is true. If, if, if it is not because of that person, you may not be here today. But what happens after that? You stay the same because you're blaming. They're always blaming. What I found is that if you don't accept responsibility, you become a liability. You just stay the same. You stay stuck. I was reading on Thursday night, I was reading the book of Genesis, and I remember that, you know, at the outset of all, of, of all our journey in the garden, Adam and Eve, God told them, don't eat the forbidden fruit. And so Eve said, it was the snake that deceived me. It was Satan that deceived me. When God asked Adam, Adam said, it was the woman that you gave me. Basically, they were, they were doing blame game. <laughs> it was the woman. It was the woman that you gave me, that God gave me. So, he was blaming Eve and he was blaming God. Because it was like, oh God, I was alone in the garden, but you said it was no good for me to be alone. And then you brought a woman into my life. It was, it's your fault, God. It's your fault. So, it was a blame game. But it gets you nowhere. It gets you, know, it gets you nowhere. Blame doesn't change anything. So, the first reaction is that we want to bury our past. The second reaction is that we, we, we do the blame game. And the third one is, we beat ourselves up. Mm. Yeah, we bite our fingers. We wallow in regrets. Yeah, I shouldn't have done this. Even because I did this. Even because I said yes. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have. And the problem with that is, is that it hinders you and stops you in the, in the next season that God wants you to go into. It stops all that God wants to give you. So those are common reactions. Now, what is the right reaction? The right reaction is our subject for today, radical forgiveness. Can we all say radical forgiveness? Radical forgiveness. forgiveness is the new F word. <laughs> yeah, radical forgiveness. And that is what Joseph did to his brothers. And we're going to look at it today. That is what Joseph did to his brothers. You see, tr treating your wounds with forgiveness unleashes the favor of God upon your life. Yeah. Uh -uh. There are so many Greek words and so many Hebrew words that are used to convey and describe forgiveness. But essentially, what it means is to release or set free. That's what it means, to release or set free. So, in general, we can say that forgiveness is, is a conscious decision 
on the part of the offended party to, to release the offender from the penalty and guilt of the offense committed. So essentially, you are releasing two parties. You are releasing the other party and you are releasing yourself. You are releasing yourself from anger and bitterness and you are, you are releasing the other person from punishment and guilt. Yeah. And so one major thing that helps us to unleash forgiveness is perspective. Can we say perspective? perspective. Can we say it again? Perspective? perspective. Yeah, that is, that, is, that is one major thing that helps us to unleash forgiveness. Yeah, perspective is one of our greatest assets as, as followers of Christ. It is, it's our greatest as, asset. Everything about the Bible is perspective. The cross, perspective. There's nothing good about nailing somebody on the cross. But when you begin to think about what it means and what it's done for us as followers of Christ, then you say, okay, this is a good thing. It led to something good. Yeah. When the word says there's a casting down, we say there's a lifting up. That is perspective. When the word says they are weak, we say we are strong. That is perspective. When we are poor, we say we are rich. That is what? That's perspective. Yeah. Genesis 45, 45 to 8. Let's see Joseph's perspective about what all the things he went through. Genesis 45, 5 to 8. But don't be upset. He was talking to his brother. He said, he says, he says, don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me ahead of you to preserve your lives. That's perspective. It, it was God. It was not you. You were just fast tracking things and making things work together for my good. It was God who sent me ahead of you. That, that's a better response. Yeah. Maybe that's the better way to see all the things that you've gone through or all the things that you're going through. That God has God knows how to work it out. He knows how to work it out. Yeah, he knows how to he knows how to work it out. It changes the way you think, isn't it? Praise God, everybody. Yeah. yeah. To to see the potential for God's power and grace in those things that you've been through. Yeah, in those in the middle of the sickness, the pain, the disappointments. Yeah. And verse six it says, This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and they will neither be plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you. That's perspective again. He sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. Verse 8. Can we say it together? I want to ready go. So it was God who sent me here, not you. That's perspective. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, he's the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of the, of the entire palace, and the governor of all Egypt. Everything Joseph said was because of his perspective. Yeah. It didn't change the fact that the brother sold him off. It didn't change the fact that he conspired against him. Yeah. It didn't change, it didn't change that. It didn't change the fact that he was cheated. It doesn't change... Perspective doesn't change the fact that you were cheated, you were abused, you were abandoned, you were neglected, you were deceived. No, it doesn't change the fact. Yeah. But it clears your future. Forgiveness doesn't change the past. It clears your future. It makes the road clear for you to move and fly. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So I may not be able to change my past... But I can embrace my future. Yeah, I can, I can embrace my future. That's perspective. Yeah, and what you begin to discover is, as you open your heart to God for healing, you begin to find that the greatest works that God wants to do in your life is ahead. It's not behind. It's not in the past. It's not in what people did to you. It's ahead. It's ahead. It's ahead. No matter how old you are, there is still a future. <laughs> and people think they are living in the future now. There's still a future, no matter how old you are. And that's why we need that perspective. It's, it's about the future that God has for you. It's about the future that God has for you. And that's why he says in Jeremiah 30, 29, 11, that I know the plans I have for you, they are plans of good and not of evil, to give you a hope and a future. A future. Yeah. yeah. So I can't sit down and continue to be sad and be mad about the mistakes of my ancestors, the mistakes of my parents, the mistakes of the past, my mistakes. And then begin to wonder where, there is, where is favor in my life. Or why, why I, lack, I lack, lack, lack power in my life. You can't, you can't sit down with bitterness and expect God to put his power and his favor upon your life. So we cannot hide in bitterness. We cannot hide bitterness in our hearts and expect God's favor. Yeah, we can't, we can't do that. So if, if you remember the, 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 the definition of favor, if favor means delight in someone, how can God delight in bitterness? Yeah, how, how can God delight in bitterness? Philippians 3.13 says, Forgetting those things which are behind, it was Paul that was talking, I forget the things that are behind, and I look forward to what is ahead, to what is in the future. There's a woman called, uh, there's a woman by the name Immaculate Ilibagiza. She's a, she's a Rwandan. Um, and she, she, she shares the story, of, the story of how she survived uh, the Rwandan genocide. Yeah. When I was doing my master's in international relations, I read about 
in the Rwandan genocide. The genocide was basically a plan by the Hutus to wipe out an entire race. So the Hutus wanted to kill the Tutsi, the Tutsi, Tutsis, they said. Yeah, they just wanted to kill all of them. So what happened was that they ended up killing one, over one million people. And it was so easy because the, the, two, the, the Tutsis had a mark. So it was easy to spot them. So they were, it was a mass killing of everywhere, killing people all over the places. It's something else. And so this lady shared the story of how she was preserved. She, she went in, she hid in the bathroom with some ladies and she got protected and she was preserved. She was preserved. So um, after the war, she came to the realization that it was God who protected her for a reason. And she was preserved and left to tell for a reason. That, that's, that's what just came on her. That like she was preserved for a reason. Among all, all the families were killed. The, the siblings, all gone. The friends, all gone. All gone. Everybody, all the people she knew, all gone. But she was preserved for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so what she did after the whole thing was that she went into the prison because she, I think she got the news and she knew the person that killed all these her family members. And so she went to the prison Said she had to, to face her fear, her fear. She went into the prison and then she told the person that killed her family members and her friends, I forgive you. I, I release you. Yeah, that, that's, that's big. Yeah, to, to, go, to go out there and say, I forgive you, I release you. Yeah. And since then, she's experienced waves and waves of glory, of testimonies, of favor. She now goes all over the place helping people resolve conflict and living a life of, of purpose. She could have been destroyed by her bitterness. Mm -hmm. She could have been wiped out. She could have killed herself. She could have been destroyed. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm not able to change my past, what am I going to do with my present in the path that takes me to the future? Yeah. We've got to change the narrative. And we've got to change our perspectives. Praise God, everybody. Amen. So Joseph's life tells us that some of the greatest blessings in our lives are unveiled through rejection. Yeah. Some of the greatest blessings that you ever see, they are unveiled through rejection. Let's see Joseph's perspective again. Genesis 50, 19 to 21. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I should punish you? I'm not God. You intended to harm me, but God. I love that phrase, but God. I was going to name this sermon, but God. <laughs> name it. To, to, to amplify the fact that God is, is a father. God, the father, God is so God, the Holy Spirit. But God, God who has a special plan for your life. But God, but God. He intended it all for good. And it brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. That's, that's, that's forgiveness, to continue to take care of the people who, who intended to harm you. Yeah. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. That is maturity. Yeah, that's maturity. So forgiveness is powerful. Yeah. It sets you free. It sets you free. Yeah. We forgive the other party. And then we forgive ourselves. And that's the hardest, actually. Yeah, yeah that's the hardest. Forgiveness is releasing a prisoner, and that prisoner is you. <laughs> yeah, that prisoner is you. The person who, who, for, who, who is offended needs to let go. He needs to let go. You need to, you need to let go of the person that offend, of, offended you. Yeah, you, because you are the one that thinks about it all the time. You're always thinking about it. And so forgiveness is, is more for you than it is for them. Yeah. And how it happens is through perspective. Can everybody say perspective? perspective? Perspective tells you that you look better than the time you were offended or than the time it started from. The time they did that evil to you, you look better now. That's perspective. Perspective. And perspective cures bitterness because bitterness is an enemy of progress. Bitterness is an enemy of progress. Bitterness is an enemy of potential. Yeah. I know so many leaders who lead in bitterness. It's, ter it's a terrible thing. Bitterness. Bitterness. Bitterness leads you to neg more negativity. It makes you stuck. You are not able to move forward. You are stuck. Yeah. But Paul, Paul offers another perspective, actually, in Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. And this is what he says. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Yeah. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. I think one beautiful way to see forgiveness is that you're not a perfect person, you're a sinner. Like I said earlier on when we were praying. And so if God in his mercy has forgiven your sins, why can't you let go? Yeah, why can't you forgive? Vengeance is God's. 
Yeah, let go, move on, and let God. And so Romans 12, 9 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I said, I nearly watched a movie, I can't remember the title. And there was an old man who was all over the place trying to kill somebody who killed his wife or something like that. And he was going from one city to, like a 90 year old man, from one city to another looking for a particular name. From one place to another, and he ended up killing himself. Yeah. Vengeance is, is a terrible thing. Mm. Yeah. So, whoever you are, no matter your age, God wants me to tell you today that your, your future is calling. Your future is calling. If you've been hurt, there is hope that there is greater things ahead of you beyond, beyond what man did to you. Because God has a better plan. So you've got to let it go. And this is what you should know today. You see, the story of Joseph is the story of Jesus. Yeah. And how do I mean? Because the, all the scriptures, sometimes you all go into the Bible looking for principles, looking for things that will confuse us. But all the scriptures point to Jesus. Yeah, Joseph is a shadow of Jesus. And what do I mean by that? Jesus was the first person who said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was the first statement he made on the cross. Yeah, Jesus was the one who was rejected. He was the one who was despised. He was the one who made that first statement. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So, if Jesus needed the cross to get to the, to the top, to get to heaven, to save your souls, whatever you've gone through, you needed it. To be who God wants you to be. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So if Jesus needed the cross, actually Jesus needed the cross to get to, to get to the grave, and he needed the grave to resurrect. Amen. Yeah. And so, and so what God did was that the stone that the builder rejected became the chief cornerstone. And that is somebody's story right now. Amen. 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 Yeah, that if, if Jesus lives on my inside, he knows how to walk bad situations into best situations. Yeah. So that's what forgiveness does. It unleashes favor into your life. Yeah, that's what it does. And God is not finished with you yet. Irrespective of what has happened, God is not finished with you yet. And he wants to use all that you've been through for your good. Yes. And set you up for a life of favor. Yeah. yeah. And so the key to living a life of favor as we journey from this first point, this first message is to live offense free. Because somebody is willing to give me an offense doesn't mean I should be willing to take it. Mm, right. There was a day I was going, I was on the train, I was going, to, I was waiting for the train. And I was, I was standing in front of the door, and people were standing on the other side, and the train stopped. And a man just walked, as if he was, I don't know what was happening to him. He just walked and pushed me aside, early in the morning, and then just went into the train. Because you are willing to give me offense doesn't mean I will take it. I just went in and then I went to another seat. I don't need to shout. <laughs> I'm not in the mood for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, so radical forgiveness sets you free sets you free as i try to, as i try to round off you know i've always tried to i've always wanted to visit um, the billy graham library many of you should know billy graham uh, i've always wanted to visit his library because of the profound impact he had on my dad he, he had on my dad's life and so this uh, past month this uh, march 2018 i had the opportunity to visit um, and so uh, ruth graham billy graham's daughter she tells a story a powerful story of forgiveness and I just want us to take a look at uh, the screen as we continue this. I have followed her all my life. <laughs> I want to thank each one of you for being here today, from those in the very back here in the tent to the very front row. We are blessed and honored that you are here. Thank you. And I have learned this week, as never before, that everybody has a Billy Graham story. And even this week, President Trump told us about his Billy Graham story. As a little boy, his father took him to Yankee Stadium to hear my father preach. And he said, this is a big deal. Little did they know that their paths would cross many, many years later. But I have my own Billy Graham story, so I'm going to tell you that one. And I've told it many times, and some of you have maybe heard it many times. But it bears repeating because, to me, it speaks to the essence of who my father was and is. After 21 years, my marriage ended in divorce. I was devastated. 
I floundered. I did a lot wrong. The rug was pulled out from under me. My family thought it'd be a good idea for me to move away, to get a fresh start somewhere else. So I decided to live near my older sister and her family and near a good church. The pastor of that church introduced me to a handsome widower, and we began to date fast and furiously. My children didn't like him, but I thought, you know, they were almost grown. They didn't know what they could, they couldn't tell me what to do. I knew what was best for my life. My mother called me from Seattle. My father called me from Tokyo. They said, honey, why don't you slow down? Let us wait to get to know this man. They had never been a single parent. They had never been divorced. What did they know? So being stubborn, willful, and sinful, I married a man, this man, on New Year's Eve. And within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled. I was afraid of him. What was I going to do? I wanted to go talk to my mother and my father. It was a two-day drive. Questions swirled in my mind. What was I going to say to Daddy? What was I going to say to Mother? What was I going to say to my children? I'd been such a failure. What were they going to say to me? You, we, we're tired of fooling with you. We told you not to do it. You've embarrassed us. And let me tell you, you women will understand you don't want to embarrass your father. You really don't want to embarrass Billy Graham. <laughs> and many of you know that we live on the side of a mountain. And as I wound myself up the mountain, I rounded the last bend in my father's driveway, and my father was standing there waiting for me. As I got out of the car, he wrapped his arms around me and he said, welcome home. There was no shame, there was no blame, there was no condemnation, just unconditional love. And you know, my father was not God, but he showed me what God was like that day. When we come to God with our sin, our brokenness, our failure, our pain and our hurt, God says, welcome home. And that invitation is open for you Thank you and God bless you. Who is it that you, <clears throat> that you need to forgive today? To be your, your daughter, like Billy Graham did. To be yourself. To be to be your friend. To be your mother. To be your grandma. I think that's what somebody actually here. Your grandma. You need to forgive your grandma. To be to be your brother. To be your sister. It could be a, a man who cheated you in, in, in Nigeria, mm -hmm. in the United States. Somebody somewhere. It could be an ex-spouse. You need to forgive right now. Yeah, I think it's it's time to be totally free. I think it's time to be to be totally free. Yes, you were you were cheated. Yes, you were abused. You were disappointed. And actually, you've, you've offended some people too. Yeah. So you, you you still have the memory you still lingers on. It comes and it's like it's it's messed up so many things in your life. It's talked to you long enough. Yeah. But God wants you. To receive it by faith today. He wants you to receive healing by faith today. Because this is a beautiful thing. You see, we all come to God for forgiveness because we all need forgiveness. We all need, for, we all need forgiveness. And so he opens your arms wide and takes you in. And he wants you to, to set somebody free today. And it's all about perspective. It's, it's all about perspective. <coughs> perspective is it's all about just changing the narrative. Yeah. I actually counseled someone. Uh, who, who, who went through some strong, challenging betrayal and, and laid, laid out to make, it's like she made a mistake that led her to the betrayal with somebody and then she went on with so many mistakes after that. So if, if, if that first step was not taken, she would have made all those, all those success, successive uh, mistakes. And so I was counseling her uh, and after the whole thing, we, I walked out to the bus stop and uh, guess what she said? He said, looking back now, I see that all things were working together for my good. Yeah, that, that's what she said. That's perspective. Looking back now, I see that all things were working together for my good. So look at you now. Look at you at the higher place now. Look at you now. 
Yeah. Look how far God has brought you. Look how far God has helped you. Yeah. I think some of us just need to admit that we need healing today. Yeah, yeah. It's happened. You may not be able to do life with the people involved like you did before, but God wants you to let go and forgive them. God wants you to admit that it happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. To stop defeating myself, I need to stop deceiving myself. That's that's that, that's that, that's enough to set somebody free today. To stop defeating myself, I need to stop deceiving myself. Yeah, so admit that you need healing today and embrace God's favor today. Yeah, as I try to try to round off, there was a time some people told me that I was too young to be a pastor. Yeah, so I said, thank you. <laughs> and it actually led me to do something. So I wrote some things down in that season. And what I've been doing is I've been reading those things to myself every morning since I became a lead pastor in this church. 22 months ago, every morning, every morning, every morning. Because I found that we are, we are ensnared or set free by the words of our mouth. Yeah. yeah, so every morning I read it to myself. If you want to do something like that, but I'm going to read this confession to you just to be a blessing to you today. This is my daily confession. I love Jesus. I believe in God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I love my wife and I will protect and care for her. I love my children and I do not raise them to survive the world, but to change the world. They love and honor God and serve Him all the days of their lives. I am disciplined. Christ is in me. I have the hope of glory. My preaching is powerful because God's word is quick and powerful. I am a trailblazer creative and anointed by God. I do not live by man's approval. I live by God's approval. I am confident, strong, and courageous. I am bold, fearless, and creative. I am not a slave to fear. I'm not too young to lead because Jesus is my boss. I thank God for who I am becoming daily, and I cooperate with him with my actions and reactions. I grow in grace daily, and I press on towards the ultimate prize. I cherish people and celebrate them. I live to bless, and I bless to live. I am not a victim of circumstances. I am a victor. I am called by God to change the world, so I am deliberate in all that I do. I am not complacent. I am bold because I'm called by God. Amen. Amen. Let's be on our feet. Let's be on our feet. Let's be on our feet. You know, one time Peter asked Jesus, How many times should I forgive? How many of you remember that? Yes. How many times should I forgive? Back then, religious leaders believed that. If you forgive somebody three times, you are a star. <laughs> you are a superstar. So Peter said, how many times should I forgive? Oh, Jesus, seven times. Should I forgive seven times? Because he remembered the, the standard three times. He said seven times. He, wanted, he, he, he thought God was going to give him an applause and say, well done. That is a good one. It's better than three. But you know what Jesus told him? He said 70 times seven. That means boundlessness. It means it is not possible to deal with your own efforts. That's what it means. It means that you need grace to do it. Because the natural reaction is, want to, is to want to punch them in the face. <laughs> that is a natural reaction. It's what to bite the finger and deal with. I will deal with you. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, we are talking about forgiveness from the heart. We are not talking about forgiveness from the mouth. That's, that's what we are talking about. And you watch what God will do in your life when you begin to live this way. Yeah. Watch, watch the favor that you unleashes on your life. Watch it. Yeah. Has this helped anybody today? Yeah. 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 So as we prepare to pray, uh, I want everybody actually to open your heart and begin to speak to God in, in your own word, in your own way. Yeah. En enough, enough of, of the bitter. It's taught you long enough. It's created a cycle. It's created a way of thinking. Yeah, it's, it's hindered you long enough. As we begin to speak out, I want you to speak out to God in your words, in your own way. Yeah, as you begin to identify pictures of people. Some of you have identified those people already in your head. As you don't be distracted, just everybody pray. Yeah, pray, pray, pray. Yeah, I can't let bitterness stop me or hold me anymore. There is no shame in my experiences, there's there is no shame in my story. I'm not defined by my past. Yeah, I'm not defined by the way I look. I'm defined by my identity in Christ. So there's no shame in my game. It's all good in the hood. Come on. Yes. Everybody's speaking to God. I want you to speak to God. Yeah. Just say, God, I help me to let it go. Yeah. I let it go. Mention those names to God and say, God, I, I release this person. I forgive myself. I forgive myself of the patterns that led to my current addiction. I forgive myself of those things that have hindered me. I forgive myself of those cycles that have stopped me from enjoying a sound relationship with God. 
and living a life of favor and enjoying a life of favor. So I want you to speak out. Speak out to God. Yeah. Let, let's all speak out to God. Both, both here and online. Everybody praying. Speaking out to God your own words. Yeah. Release them. Release yourself. Forgiveness helps you emotionally. It helps you spiritually. It helps you physically. It unleashes the favor of God upon your life. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Give you all the praise. Some of us need to actually take it further and go and ask for forgiveness. Yeah, that's for somebody here. You, you need to go and ask for forgiveness from somebody. You need to say, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I was wrong, I'm sorry. Yeah, some of us need to do that. I forgive you. How many of you are honest that you identified somebody that you need to forgive or that you need to go and ask for forgiveness for? Lift up your hand. If you are honest, you identify somebody that you need to forgive or someone that you need to go and ask for forgiveness for, for, from. Thank you very, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Hands down. Radical forgiveness equals the favor of God. Yeah, it, that's what leads to the favor of God. So I'm going to pray for you right now, and I want you to be bold. Whatever action that God has put in your heart, follow it up and do it. Yeah. Follow it up and do it. Yeah. I'm going to pray for us right now. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the deep work you've done in people here today. Thank you for those hands that went up. Lord, I just ask for healing today. Healing deep down in the hearts. Than, than, than what man can do. Deep down that only you can do. All, all those strong words that works that only you can do. I ask for healing today in the hearts of your people in the name of Jesus. I ask for the boldness and the courage to actually take that bold step to release that person, that bold step to ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. I, I pray for a wave of your peace upon their lives in this season. And I pray for an outpouring of your favor upon their lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we sit, before we take our seats, eyes closed. If you're here, you want, to, you want to give your life to Jesus. You see, giving your life to Jesus is like a journey. When you start, you are not perfect. When you start, you, you are a sinner. Like, yeah. But you give your life to Jesus, and what happens at that point is that you have a willingness to change. You have a willingness to experience new life. It's not like you have a willingness to stay stuck and stay in sin. It's, it's you have a willingness to change. That's what it means. You're surrendering your life to God. And so God, you begin to walk consistently in God, and He begins to transform you, transform you, transform you, transform you. So if you're here today, or you're watching online, and you want to give your life to Jesus today, you want to start a journey with God today, Lift up your hand and we're, and we're going to pray together. If you're watching or live, you're here, lift up your hand and we're going to pray together. Okay? Let, let, let's all pray together out loud. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you for your son. Thank you for your son. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I, accept, I, accept him, I accept him into my life today. Come into my heart. Transform me. I don't want to stay stuck in the past. Stay stuck in negative ideologies. I embrace your life. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, walk up to me after church and speak to me. Let's put our hands together for Jesus and take our seat. Take your seat. Have you been blessed today? Yes. Hallelujah. That's week one. Okay, you rolling? Okay. We're going to scare Jason with this spider. Come on. We're going to get him back. Watch it. Guys, this is a film set. You got it. Oh! Fire! Tons of things happen in our lives every day. And in a 24 hour period, we ask ourselves so many different questions. Like, what should I eat? What should I wear? Or who should I hang out with? Sometimes we ask bigger questions like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Who will I marry? Or where will I live? But every once in a while, we ask ourselves those even bigger questions. Questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And is there more to life than this? 
The reality is, there aren't a lot of places we can go to explore life's biggest questions. So on Alpha, we want to create a space where we can talk about those kind of questions in a way that's open and honest. In each one of our hearts, it's like we have a happiness bucket that we're constantly trying to fill. It can sound like this. If I just had uh, more money or nicer clothes or a new girlfriend, then I'd be happy. The nights would come and the girls would be gone. Like, they'd be just me, you know, me and I guess God, right? And I'm like, okay, there's definitely more to life than this. Like, I just want, I want, I want, I want, and you don't get anything. There's this deeper, even spiritual hunger that we're all trying to satisfy. As someone who grew up an atheist at home, I wasn't just gonna accept what he was gonna say. So I was like, okay, did this actually happen historically? What's the evidence? I'm not gonna just buy into something because I get swept up in the emotion of it. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. And we wanna invite you to spend less than 24 of them with us on Alpha.